Aaron Bushnell recently set himself on fire and died in protest of the Israeli genocide of Palestinians. Make no mistake, this was the extreme act of a desperate person. In the face of such an extreme act, powerful institutions will want us to believe that anyone who could conceive of such a thing must be crazy. Yet one could also say that it is crazy to ignore the systematized killing of a group of people. What led Aaron to self-immolate? And indeed, what does it mean to be crazy? Obvious warnings, if you are or have been suicidal, please proceed through this video with caution. And there are additional warnings or mentions of family and cult abuse. I think that the way that powerful institutions will look at Aaron's acts and say, these are the acts of a crazy person. To me, it begs the question, what is a healthy response to genocide? Or what do these institutions think is a healthy response for genocide? When it comes to Palestine, everything should be very clear that there is a genocide happening and that for those of us who feel called to, we can do whatever we can to stop that from happening. And there have been a number of different forms of protest, right? So Aaron's act exists along a continuum. There have been other protests. There have been vigils, marches. There have been interruptions of political proceedings. There have been sit-ins. There have been people disrupting the flow of traffic. So there's been a, a whole range of different forms of political action. And all of these, to me, make sense as valid or justified forms of, re of reactions to the fact that there's a genocide happening. But I think when it comes to our institutions, what what they want for us is for us to not be paying attention, is for us to not care, to be distracted by sports, by celebrity culture, by whatever else, right? That's what they want for us. There's this quote, which I have found particularly meaningful by this uh, philosopher, Jiryu Krishnamurti, and the quote goes like this. It is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. What does this mean? I think it's very straightforward. We can't be healthy if we are disconnected from ourselves and from the suffering of those around us. We can't go and, and have our hut in the middle of the woods somewhere, off on an island away from the rest of humanity and say, well, I'm healed, right? I'm doing well. Um, that's not what healing looks like. To me, healing is we're paying attention to how people around us are doing. And if they're doing well, then we all can heal together. If we as individuals are okay day to day, that's no measure of health. That's what Krishnamurti is saying. And I very much agree with that. I think a healthy response to a fundamentally unhealthy world is going to look a little unhealthy. It's going to look like coping mechanisms that are a little destructive. It's going to look like protest that disrupts the system. So I think if we put this into context, the systems are going to say this is unhealthy, but these are systems that are fundamentally unhealthy. And that's what they want for us. Aaron's act was a refusal to dissociate. And in his history, if we look at what is publicly available now about his life, it represents that he has refused to dissociate repeatedly. Okay, so let's start with his family. Um, his mom actually released a statement. It wasn't a public statement. It was something sent to their uh, religious community. She said, Aaron was not well at the end. We pleaded with him to seek help from his superiors in the Air Force. My son fell victim to propaganda during a long mental health battle. We are Bible-believing Christians, and we support Israel 100%. We ask for your prayers at this time. When I saw this, that was when I had sort of had this inkling of an idea to make this video, because I think this narrative does tend to proliferate of, you know, this person is upset about something, they are willing to speak out about it. Obviously, they're the problem, right? The problem is not the genocide that's happening. The problem is not that especially in a family, people who speak truth of uh, harm happening in a family. The problem is not that the family is messed up or that the society is messed up. The problem is that this person who is speaking the truth is misguided, has been led astray by some external force. Um, 
Well, here's what Aaron had to say about that. In a comment I pulled from his Reddit account, he said, I am a survivor of a toxic, abusive family system. Aaron uh, grew up his first 18 years with his family and also with the community of Jesus, which is a Christian cult. Now, this is not just something that Aaron has shared. Some of his friends, people who knew him, have come out and said he directly said this was a cult. This is also something that other people who have left have said about it, have said this was a cult. They use mass brainwashing tactics, abuse, manipulation. And so for those who are unfamiliar and might be wondering, is that not a little bit of an exaggeration? Like, what does that even mean, right, for it to be a cult? Well, think, think about um, working long hours and never resting, essentially never having time to think for yourself. That was Aaron's experience from the time he was brought up. Imagine public humiliation, rituals in which people who do not do exactly as the group is saying, those people are humiliated and are cast aside as people who are doing wrong. Imagine being cut off from the outside world. That was the reality with the community of Jesus. And so it's not surprising that these so-called Bible-believing Christians are also fascist in support of the state of Israel. Aaron made the decision to leave because he could not dissociate from the harm he was experiencing, both as a member of his family system and the harm he was experiencing in service of this cult. He refused to dissociate and, and continue to try to survive in that environment, and so he left pretty much penniless. He tried to survive, and that was what led him to the Air Force. You know, and, and there is something to be said for the military recruiting people who are poor, recruiting people who have no other options. So, you know, the propaganda of the military is that it's an all-volunteer force, but in practice, it's not like people are really volunteering for this. Additionally, it's very common for cult survivors to end up in the military. Why? Because it's actually very similar. So there's the strict hierarchy. There's the ideology about us and our group versus the whole world. There's the normalization of abuse, the normalization of humiliation, um, not being able to listen to our body, not being able to take breaks, right? Whatever our commanding officer says, that's what we're doing. There's a TikToker by the name of Group Behavior Gal who also is a survivor of a cult and also went directly into the military pretty much after that. And here's what she has to say about this. This person said it not better than I could have. I said it in 382 pages in Uncultured, but yeah. In fact, most veterans that set out to read my book say they're a little skeptical that I'm going to be able to like make the parallel between cult and army. Usually ends up being because they don't actually understand that much about cults. And once they wade through it, they're like, yep, you convinced me. And again, in the Air Force, Aaron could not dissociate, refused to dissociate, and was instead present with the reality of what he was experiencing. And what he saw in the Air Force was that he was serving as a tool or a pawn of U.S. hegemony and imperialism. He saw the ramifications of what he was being told to do and how it was impacting people. And this led him down a path of becoming increasingly more critical of the United States and the political system more broadly. He did a lot of learning and engaging online, watching such YouTubers like Anarch or Andrewism, people that you might be familiar with. Also, he did a lot of mutual aid in supporting, in particular, houseless people. Um, but yeah, I think it would be remiss of me not to include some things he directly said. So in a blurb from an organizing thing that he had been working on with other people, he said, I am an anarchist, which means I believe in the abolition of all hierarchical power structures, especially capitalism and the state. I view the work we do as fighting back in the class war, which the capitalist class wages on the rest of humanity. This also informs the way in which I want to organize, as I believe that any hierarchical power structure is bound to reproduce class dynamics and oppression. Thus, I want to engage in egalitarian forms of organizing that produce horizontal power structures based on mutual aid and solidarity, which are capable of liberating humans. I favor consensus-based decision-making over democratic or voting-based governance. And I source this from CrimeThink, who have a great retrospective on Aaron with a number of his 
friends contributing to that. Um, that'll be in the description. Really at the core of what Aaron did is a refusal to dissociate, and he had been refusing to dissociate his entire life. And for him, that meant self-immolation. That doesn't mean, that doesn't have to be what it means for everybody. There is a history of self-immolation of people doing this as a way of calling attention to extreme injustice or extreme violence and to say, like, maybe I don't have a voice in other ways, but I can do this. I can shock people out of their own dissociation, out of their own, you know, not paying attention. The most notable modern uh, sort of beginnings of this happened in 1963 with Tip Quang Duc. Um, who was protesting the Vietnamese government's treatment of Buddhist people at that time. Uh, and this form of protest also spread to the U.S. in people protesting the U.S. involvement in the war in Vietnam. And Norman Morrison set himself on fire outside of the, the Pentagon. Defense Secretary Robert McNamara was so influenced by that that he had been writing to Morrison's widow about how heavily impacted he was and he had been getting ready to send more troops and I think this sort of led to that dissolving over time. Another recent example is Hausni Kalia. His act of self-immolation really in 2011 really kick-started the Arab Springs. Now in 2024 we have Aaron Bushnell's act of self-immolation. If we put these things into context these are acts of extreme protest that people engage with as a way of catalyzing the people who agree with them and of shocking the people who would otherwise turn away. So sometimes these acts are forgotten about, are not really mentioned, don't tend to you know, enter into the media or into the mainstream. Sometimes they have huge impacts and I think Aaron has been having that impact. We have these powerful institutions who will wanna say, you're crazy. Anyone who might go along with this or who might think you have a point is crazy. Craziness is a social construct, right? So there is nothing inherently biological or inherently true in the concept of being crazy or disconnected from whatever someone else says is normal. It's inherently a political construct. So this is something that Michel Foucault talks about in his work, uh, History of Madness. He talks about how historically with different philosophical periods, different governmental periods, people who are mad or what we would call crazy were looked at in these different kinds of ways. So looked at as being animalistic, as not having human sensations, but of being like devolved forms of humans. And so those people might be tortured and people would think, oh, they can't experience the pain. Then there was a period in which people were viewed as possibly being wise or having this insight into the human condition that other people might not have. Then there was this period of them being cast away, of being put and hidden in asylums where, you know, wealthy families could send family members who were doing something that they didn't like that would cast a bad name on their family. And then down the line, also when these asylums became publicly funded that houses people or travelers would be sent to asylums as a way of sort of getting them off the street, as a way of looking at it as like, you know, there's something wrong with you and so we're just going to lock you away in a warehouse, essentially, where you're being tortured. Um, that is the history of asylums. And now we end up in a position where these people who are considered crazy or mad are medicalized. And so it's this like biological illness that people can have that is likened to other forms of biological illness. And so pharmaceutical companies profit off of that by selling medications and saying, you know, you have to be on this medication for the rest of your life. Is that true or not? That's the subject for another day. Franz Fanon also talks about this in the, in the context of colonization and oppression, where he's looking at the imposition of these Western European styles of looking at madness or mental illness and of saying people are ill, there's something wrong with them, when there were other ways of understanding that. There were ways of integrating those people into the community and not isolating them. But with the influence of colonization that those people were viewed as sick and needing to be treated. And also that the colonization would cause those symptoms, right? Because, you know, you're 
understanding of where you are in the world and of your community is being torn to shreds by colonizers who are coming in and just destroying your way of life. Of course, you're going to have what some might call mental illness, but it's not you as an individual that is sick. It is the situation. It is the society that is doing these things to you that you're having a justified reaction. So Fanon talks about that. I think also when we look at the specifics of suicide, this is something that Huey Newton wrote about in his autobiography on a revolutionary suicide. So Newton looks at suicide as being one of two different kinds of things. On the one hand, we have what we commonly think of as being a suicide, which is a reactionary suicide. So we are being in despair about our environment. We are experiencing a great deal of suffering and we see no way out. So we commit suicide. On the flip side, he looks at what he calls revolutionary suicide, which is we have so much hope, we have so much belief that the world can be better, and we really can see what that would look like, that we are willing to put ourselves into harm's way, knowing that that's the only way that world will be possible. And as a result of that, we may well die sooner than we would have if we dissociated, because we're willing to fight for a better world. We're willing to act in such a way that it brings that risk upon us. And I think it really does make a lot of sense to look at Aaron Bushnell's actions as being revolutionary suicide. And I know there's other people who have talked about that framing, one of whom is Steph Kaufman. Um, I highly recommend their interview on the Death Panel podcast that will be in the description below. What craziness is, is a refusal to dissociate of being present with whatever it is we're experiencing. And so the rest of society, which doesn't want to hear about that, which doesn't want to acknowledge that there are people who have done you harm, doesn't want to acknowledge that there are problems with the way society is organized, will say, you're sick, you're mad, you're crazy, there's something wrong with you. And of course, this is inherently ableist, and this is like an inherent like cornerstone of how ableism functions when it comes to mental health. The alternative is that we're telling the truth. I think fundamentally that is what it means to be crazy, is to tell the truth, no matter the consequences, the world will call you crazy. What Aaron is asking of us is to break our dissociation, is to stop dissociating. Because I know many of us will feel numb being bombarded with information about suffering, violence, things we feel like we don't have a lot of control over, even when our, in our own lives we are feeling suffering and a lot of frustration about that. So it's very normal in this context to be dissociated, to live through life most of the time always being dissociated. But I think what Aaron is asking, and I think it's the least we can do, is to break away from that dissociation a little bit. That doesn't mean we have to do what he did. So I think a key understanding of what dissociation is and how it functions is like when we're dissociating, we are shut down. We are not able to connect with the truth of our experiences because that would lead to more suffering. I think I'm, this is the unfortunate aspect of not dissociating is sometimes it does lead, lead to more suffering. Sometimes it does mean that we are not doing well because we are actually feeling and experiencing all of the terrible things as they are happening, right? I think the alternative of being numb is like, we can sort of get through with that. So it may or may not be feasible as much for you to dissociate or to remove dissociation, depending on what else is going on in your life. But I think what Aaron is asking of us is to step away from dissociation and to, when we do that, we really have a choice. We have agency in what we do next. We are able to say, I'm acknowledging the truth of this thing that is happening. This is what I wanna do about it. And now maybe I can take those steps. Maybe you can't take those steps, but there's nothing wrong with saying that we know what's happening and these are the steps I would like to take. Maybe those are not all feasible, but I think we don't really know what steps we wanna take unless we stop dissociating. So I really think this is what Aaron is asking of us, is to stop dissociating. And in many ways, I think this is what has been happening. A lot of people, I think, protests have continued. There have been people who are continuing to do all they can to stop the genocide that has been happening. So I think that we collectively are 
honoring Aaron's memory and his sacrifice. So in terms of how to stop dissociating, and in particular, if you're feeling very upset, very like unmoored by what's been happening, here's what I would suggest. Take a break from your day-to-day, week-to-week routine. In particular, take a break from whatever media you are consuming or not consuming. Just take some time away from that. The news will still be there when you are done taking your break. This can be an hour, a day, a few days. Just take some time away and like take that time with yourself. Um, consider either more exercise or less exercise, depending on whichever is normal for you, whatever is going to help you to see like, okay, this is my body, this is what's going on. Um, consider taking a break from substances. If you're regularly using certain substances to cope with how terrible the world is, consider taking a small break. Um, just to check in with yourself about how are things without that substance. Whatever tool of dissociation you have, because I'm sure there's many, I couldn't even think of all of them, but consider taking a break from whatever your form of dissociation is. Consider checking in with yourself. And I also am a big fan of journaling, so I would encourage journaling, especially if that's not something you're familiar with. Here are some journaling prompts for you if this is something you would like to try. So first, what I would ask is write about what happened, right? So this is what Aaron did. This is how you heard about it. Next, you write about how you're feeling about that. How are you feeling about that? I'm sure you have thoughts. And finally, what you would journal about is what in your history are those feelings and is the situation connected to, right? Many of us will have prior experiences of disempowerment, of shock, of dissociation that we can trace back to previous times in our lives. And this type of thing can really bring that up. So in particular, if, if, if you're wanting to not dissociate for a longer period of time, we have to be ready for the type of stuff that will come up from previous times of things we might not have had the capacity or the space to really connect with at that time. These are some things I would suggest. And because of the nature of what we're dealing with, which is a, which is a suicide, a revolutionary suicide, but, a, but someone who died by their own hand, nonetheless. I think Aaron is clear in, in understanding what happened as being like being killed by the system. But this nevertheless can be sort of triggering if we have thoughts of suicide. Um, so if this is something you're feeling and I feel some obligation to like speak directly to this, if you are feeling suicidal, um, what I would suggest, connect directly with what you need in the moment, moment to moment, in terms of food, water, connection, exercise, sun, these sorts of things, I know it's sort of cliche to bring them in, but often when we're feeling poorly, these are not things that we are on top of. And so I think it bears repeating, just take care of whatever is the most obvious thing in front of you that will help even a little bit. And you will then be able to more effectively deal with the overwhelming sense of dread or powerlessness or hopelessness that is connected to those feelings of suicide. And then, if and when you feel up for this, to really interrogate, where are these feelings coming from? Why are they coming up? You know, talk about that with someone you trust who is not mandated to call the police, um, because we all know that doesn't help. In conclusion, I really think what Aaron is asking of us is to no longer dissociate, what I would ask of you is just to sort of ask, like, what is the role of dissociation in your life? And how can you choose to be present with the state of the world in a way that feels more sustainable for you? Because we're not really going to be able to feel everything all the time. That's not really going to work for us. So finding those moments, finding ways of connecting with that. If this is something you would feel might help, I do have a video on hope and hopelessness, which I will link on the side. I might also suggest checking that one out if you're wondering where to go next from here.